Hey guys, welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about creating a whitetail sanctuary and the prep work that needs to be done prior to creating this bedding sanctuary. This will be the first video in what's hopefully a multi-video series showing you guys how this area changes over time. Most of the videos that we put together for this channel are for projects that we're doing on this property, and most of the videos are done after the project has been completed, so we're kind of showing you what it looks like afterwards. This video is gonna be a little bit different because we're gonna be showing you what this area looks like prior to the improvement. And as you can see behind me, you can see a lot of open woods, and this is the area that we're gonna be creating the whitetail sanctuary. And I really wanted to show you guys what this area looked like prior to any work being done, mainly because this is what a lot of properties look like here in Michigan. You have a lot of open timber during the hunting season and throughout the winter months you can see really far. If you look behind me, you can see you know a few hundred yards in every direction. And while that might be nice when you're taking the family for a walk during the woods, it's not so nice during the hunting season because deer don't really want to be back here. They want to be somewhere where they're safe and they don't feel safe in open hardwoods like this. So again, we're gonna be turning what was open hardwoods and virtually a deer desert throughout the hunting season into very high stem count, secure bedding cover and a whitetail sanctuary. And the first step in putting in one of these larger bedding locations on your property, and it's really no different than installing any improvement on your property, is you have to have a plan. You do not wanna just start cutting trees down in any area of your property. It has to make sense with the overall plan of your property. And with that, I will say that every property is different and there's not gonna be any two properties that have bedding locations in the exact same spot. But for the most part, you wanna to try to follow certain themes to make sure that you don't run into trouble down the road. And the first thing that you wanna to try to make sure that you're taking into consideration when choosing a location for these bedding areas or these sanctuaries is you wanna to try to make sure you take your access into consideration. You do not normally wanna be putting these bedding areas right next to your access. If you do that, you're gonna have a hard time getting around these bedding areas when you're leaving your stand locations in the morning and also when you're trying to get to your stand locations in the afternoon. If you have to consistently either walk through those bedding locations or walk really close to them as you're trying to get to and from your stand locations, you're just gonna be increasing the chances that you're gonna be pushing those deer out before you even get to hunt. And the more you spook deer, the more pressure you're going to be adding to your property and the less predictable the deer movement is going to be. So that's the first thing that I would consider when trying to find a location for these bedding sanctuaries is try to make sure that it's away from your access. And there's no exact science on how far away that they should be from access. For me, I like to make sure that it's at least 50 yards away from my access. A lot of times, depending on topography and the type of screening that you can install, you can sneak around any improvement as long as you're about 50 yards away. If you have clean access, you have some sort of a screen so the deer can't see you, you can get pretty close to deer, I would say within 50 yards, without them realizing that you're trying to sneak around that particular improvement. The next thing you wanna make sure you already have done prior to choosing a location for the bedding area is you already have a place picked out for food plots. Installing food plots on your property is essential when you're trying to establish that predictable deer movement on your property. And depending on the property, every single one is different. There may be only a few places that you're able to install food plots. And so that would need to be the priority. With these bedding locations, you can put these in a lot of different places. Deer will bed on hillsides, they'll bed in those low wet areas that you can't really plant a food plot. And so you wanna make sure that you have a location picked out for your food plots first, especially if you have a property with very limited options on where you can place a plot and then start figuring out where you want to place these bedding locations. And again, guys, every single property is going to be laid out a little bit differently. Those are just two things that I like to take into consideration prior to selecting a location for these bedding areas. And to give you guys an example of this particular property and this particular bedding area and, and why we chose the location, uh, this location is about 200 yards from our food plots, which are behind the camera, uh, north of this bedding location, and it's gonna be placed in the center of our property. We have a very narrow property. It's only about 200 yards wide. So we have about 50 yards on one side of the bedding area that we're gonna be leaving unimproved, and the same thing on the opposite side. And and what that's going to do is once we have this bedding area installed, it's going to create an edge about 50 yards from the property border that the deer are going to work around 
this bedding area. So that's gonna give us very predictable deer movement during the hunting season as these deer work along the edge of this bedding area. And those bucks throughout the fall are gonna be working the downwind edge, whichever edge that is, and that's gonna be the edge that you wanna be hunting anyways because you don't want your wind blowing into the bedding area, you want that wind blowing away from the bedding area. So not only will you be having a stand location blowing your scent away from the improvement, away from your property, but you're also gonna be sitting downwind of this bedding area where those bucks are already gonna be cruising, checking for does. Once you have the location for your bedding area established, the next thing that I like to do is I like to create a perimeter trail that's gonna wrap around the entire future bedding location. And this is gonna be the trail that you're gonna be hunting over. This is gonna be the trail that a lot of times those bucks are gonna be walking during the hunting season again as they're working the downwind edge of the bedding area. And I'm a very visual person, so I like to have this trail established prior to doing any cutting. That way, uh, when these tr trees eventually do fall over top of the trail, I know exactly where I need to section those logs out to keep my trail open. Now, if you did not wanna create this trail prior to cutting, that's fine. Just know that after the cutting is done, you are gonna to wanna to go through and, and carve a trail around the perimeter of that bedding area because that's gonna be the edge that those deer are gonna really wanna work during the hunting season. The next step in preparing this area for your whitetail sanctuary is to go in and map the deer sign. And there's no better time to map sign than immediately following the hunting season. And there's, there's two things that I'm really looking for when I'm going in to map the sign. Uh, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going in and I'm mapping all the deer trails. And there are a few ways that you can map the trails. We're gonna be talking about three of them in this video. And I kind of use a combination of all three. The first way would be to use a GPS tracking app on your phone. A lot of the hunting apps have this. I use OnX, so I'll go to the tracker on there and I'll just start a track and then I'll just kind of walk the deer trails as I'm moving through this area. And you don't necessarily have to follow every single trail, but you wanna follow these trails that connect to these major focal points. And we're actually standing on one right now. It's a major intersection. So we have, again, that trail that wraps around this entire area. And there's also another trail that leads north, and there's a trail that kind of leads back into this area right now. Uh, it kind of goes straight behind me. And so this is a major focal point. So this is where I want to kind of start my, my tracking. And then what I'll do is I'll walk straight back and follow a trail that kind of leads to another focal point uh, on the south side of my property. I have another pinch point that we created uh, last off season with a water hole mock scrape. So I wanna make sure that I'm connecting this focal point with other ones on the perimeter of the property. So you're not necessarily mapping every single trail, you're just kind of mapping the main ones as they go from one focal point to another. The second thing that I really like to do when mapping these trails, and this is gonna be for you guys that have younger timber where, where the trees aren't as spaced out, is to take flagging tape and kind of mark the trail as you go. That way visually you can kind of see how that trail wraps around. And I don't know if you can see behind me, but I do have yellow flagging tape on a maple, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 yards behind the camera. Not really sure if the camera can focus on that or not. And I'm using this as a visual marker. So regardless of the time of year, whenever I'm doing the work, I know exactly how this trail is coming from this point, working its way through the timber and coming out on the other side. It's easy to see these trails now during the off season when there's not a lot of growth. But as we start pushing into you know, late April, May, June, July, and there, it's just gonna be a thick mess back here, it's gonna be a lot harder for you to tell exactly where you wanted that trail to be. So that's where having the flagging tape comes in so you can kind of remember how you wanted that trail to move through that area. The last thing I'm doing when I'm mapping these trails, and this is gonna be for more of you guys with uh, more mature timber where there's a lot of space in between these trees and you don't really have a lot of trees to put flagging tape on, is again, very similar to using flagging tape, but I'm using little survey flags, and I'm sure you can see those behind me, to, to mark exactly where I want that trail to go. So that way, uh, again, when, when everything starts to green up, or when you start knocking all these trees down, you can continue to see where that trail is supposed to go. As you can see behind me, it's very open, it looks really clean, and it's really easy to see how these deer trails are moving through the area. However, once we start taking all these trees down, it's gonna create a big mess, and it's gonna be a lot harder to see how we wanted these trails to move through this bedding location. And so that's where either the flagging tape comes in or these little survey flags come in so that we can clear the trail that we initially wanted to promote. And guys, the reason that I really like to map and use existing deer trails when trying to promote deer movement is because there is a reason that they're taking 
these trails. Regardless of what that reason is, if there's a way to make the existing trail work within the improvement, then I'm gonna to try to incorporate that existing trail into the plan because you're gonna have a much higher probability that those deer are going to use that path. The next thing that I wanna make sure that I'm doing as it relates to mapping deer sign within this future sanctuary is I wanna make sure that I'm going in and marking down the locations that these deer are preferring to bed in now. Now, again, it's open hardwood, so there's not very many locations that these deer really want to bed in now, but there are a few spots that the deer want to bed in. Uh, there's a little stream back there that kind of snakes through the back of the property, and where that stream bows out, those deer really like to bed on those points. And so I wanna mark those locations down so future Jake remembers, make sure to keep this area open for future deer beds. There's also a couple high spots within this low area where the deer really like to bed. So I need to make sure again to mark those areas so future Jake doesn't drop a bunch of trees onto that spot and kind of ruin a preferred bedding location. And the reason that I'm going back there to mark the individual locations on where these deer prefer to bed now is no different than why I'm marking these trails. And that's because whenever possible, I wanna to try to fit what the deer already prefer to do into the future improvement. Let's say I did not take the time to mark these bedding locations and map these deer trails. And during cutting, we dropped a tree over top of an existing buck bed that's been used for years. Now, while there's still a decent chance that within this few acres of cutting that we're going to do, that a buck's gonna find a decent place to lay down, you would have destroyed one of the preferred buck bedding locations on your property. So I prefer to take a little bit of extra time to mark these individual bedding locations and map these trails, and when possible, try to fit the plan around what the deer already want to do. The next step in the sanctuary preparation process, and again, this is prior to doing any cutting, is to determine how you're going to get the work done. Do you wanna be doing the work yourself or do you want to have somebody come in and do the work for you? And again, every property is different. Some properties are going to have younger timber or, or timber that doesn't really have a lot of value to it. So it's gonna be very difficult to get somebody to come in and wanna clear that area out. However, there are other properties out there that have a lot more value in those trees. And if that's the case, you might be able to get a logger out there to harvest that area and do the work for you. This is the direction that I would explore first if you think that you have older and more marketable timber. And if this sounds like your property, another thing that I would recommend doing is contacting a forester. And what a forester will do is they'll walk your property with you and let you know, you know how far away you are from a timber harvest and if you have any marketable timber. And if they do think that you have marketable timber, especially in the areas that you want to cut, then they're going to bid out the job to multiple loggers. And from there, you guys would review and select the company that best fits your needs. Now, the forester will take a percentage of the proceeds, but I would say most of the time, the landowner is going to net more when using a forester, again, because he's going to bid out the job to multiple loggers, as opposed to the landowner trying to find a logger himself. For creating the sanctuary, the bedding area behind me here, we are gonna be doing all of the cutting ourselves. I did have a forester walk this property with me uh, a year ago, and he said that I think we were about 10 years away from a timber harvest. And so you just kinda of have to make a decision at that point. Do you want to wait the 10 years, have the work done at that point, or do you wanna kinda of get the ball rolling and, and do the work yourself? It, but again, you're gonna be losing out on any financial gain if you do it yourself. But fortunately, we don't mind doing the work ourselves. We also burn a lot of wood, so that's another positive when you're cutting trees down yourself. But all the work on this whitetail sanctuary will be done by us and I'm really excited to show you guys how this area is going to be transformed over time. And guys, the final step in the preparation process to creating a whitetail sanctuary is to make sure that you have all the equipment that you need. Now, if you're gonna be having somebody else do the work, then it's on them to make sure that they have all the equipment that they need. However, if you're gonna be doing the work yourself, then you need to make sure that you have all the equipment. And this goes beyond just making sure that you have a chainsaw and a few felling wedges. You need to make sure that you have all of the safety equipment as well. Anytime that you're doing any type of chainsaw work, you need to make sure that you're using all of the safety equipment, you know, your helmet, your chaps, gloves, steel-toed boots. If, you, if your helmet does not have a visor, make sure you're wearing safety glasses. It's not worth having an accident and hurting yourself because you weren't wearing the appropriate safety gear. So guys, please don't take any shortcuts when it comes to safety. It's, it's just not worth it. But guys, I think that's gonna wrap it up for the first video on creating a whitetail sanctuary and kind of the prep work that you guys need to make sure that you're doing prior to doing any cutting. 
Hopefully in the next video, uh, what you see behind me is gonna look a lot different. If you guys do have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the comment section below. I'll get back to those as soon as I can, and we will see you guys in the next video.